Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gateway Office Hours. This is episode 72. I'm your host, Ben Larson. I'm here with my co-founder, Carter Laren. I'm back. Wait, were you gone? Oh, yeah, you were here next last week. Yeah, you just didn't I, want to I gave you camera. a shot at the intro. Uh, we are here today. Yeah, I guess I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> we're here today with Jamie Feaster, the uh, VP of Marketing for Ease. You might have heard of him. Uh, you can criticize him if you want, but it's hard to deny. <laughs> That's where we're starting? Well, I'm That's just saying. <laughs> there might be someone in this room who has been known to say any, you know, one thing or another. Wow. Yeah. Why don't you tell people where to follow us and all that shit? I will. And then, <laughs> and then we'll stop. It's, it's hard to well, deny whatever Jesus it is we're doing impact. right now. I don't know. Um, they have <laughs> over 100 employees now. They've raised $52 million. They're kicking ass in the industry, and they're getting you your product very quickly. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. You can follow us on all the socials at Gateway VC and get all the information you need and follow us and subscribe and comment and do all the things at officehours.tv. Um, yeah. So we're going to get into it. We're I think Ease is unstoppable. Can I at least say that? Like, it does. You know, it you've kind got of feels like that. I mean, yeah. they're just, just steamrolling and really expanding very quickly throughout right. California. Um, I see them on billboards, buses, and I'm sure that's all part of the marketing strategy. We'll get into that. Um, but on top of Ease's, uh, your experience with Ease, mm -hmm. uh, Jamie, Thank you for being on the show. Of course, yeah. Thank yeah. you Welcome for having me. Thank this you. is awesome. Yeah. Sorry for the rocky start there. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, I, 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 was, I was a little nervous about having someone from Ease on the show because there was uh, there were some quotes from me, and I wasn't attacking Ease, but it came. Oh, it, it looked weird in print. Now, <laughs> now people are going to go look for those. <laughs> we welcome it's a, it. Hey, just, all news just is not good. mention it. All it's, news is happen. news, right? Um, mm -hmm. No, but we're very happy you're here. Uh, like I said, it's it's undeniable that Ease is doing incredible things in the industry and uh, kind of bringing that that light to the industry that, that gets investors really excited. Which well, makes and they're the excited. first place that newbies think of when they like, I mean, most new people don't want to go to the, you know, a dispensary underneath a bridge or whatever, wherever they are, yeah. right? Yeah. And so they were like, oh, where do I get it online? Especially if they're millennials. And Ease, I think, is the, as far as I can tell, the, the number one place that people think of. Yeah, it's all about convenience. That Really, that's where it came from. That was the insight that started the business, was when you looked at the category, there wasn't really a easy platform for accessing marijuana, period. Mm -hmm. So what we did was really look at the primary blockers for people, and it was, you know, really the dispensaries were zoned in places they didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, finding a place to get a card, like that process was really missed, sort of cloudy and, uh, and, and not really um, easy for people to understand. They didn't know if it went on their record. They didn't know all these things. So what we did is brought technology tools that let people, you know, connect to a doctor and get a delivery from the comfort of home. Mm -hmm. And that really is is really what got us going. Yeah. So let's talk about your background a little bit because you've yeah. gone, you've done marketing at a variety of companies beforehand, yep. a lot of digital marketing experience. Can you just walk us through kind of a really briefly an overview of your sure. background and why you decided to uh, jump into the cannabis industry actually pretty early, right? 2014 is, is quite early um, compared to most people that are in the industry now that are kind of yeah uh, of legit course. operators, so let's put it that way. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so I, I'll just kind of give you a, some background. So I was actually, um, my first job in San Francisco was in 2010. I actually came and um, got an internship at an ad agency. And my first account was Ubercab, so that was kind of an interesting hmm. Um, experience to learn, and back then it was you know town cars. It was luxury trans, you know luxury transportation was their focus. So it was kind of like, how do you position that in the marketplace and and kind of watch their growth, which was cool. Um, but did you after end up that, a piece of that growth at all? No, unfortunately not. Oh, we were right. just an agency partner. <laughs> um, but when I after that I went to a startup called Bright Roll, which really is video advertising. Um, but really I, I was always kind of at these innovative companies, kind of on the edge of their industries. And at Bright Roll, it was all about how do you move from this traditional media buying marketplace to a programmatic platform where you just kind of make a bid on the inventory, and then it kind of you know, runs itself. So that was cool to see their their growth. And then from there, I kind of just stayed in like the ad tech world for mm -hmm. a few years. 
And then I was at Disneyland with my family. This is kind of my my, my mm. East story. It's kind of funny. I'm your, at your, Dis- your pot story starts at Disneyland. <laughs> with family, yes, the happiest place <laughs> in the, on earth. Yeah. So I'm there with my family. We're leaving, and I we run into this guy Keith, and he's the sole founder of Ease. Mm-hmm. And I run into him, and I'm like, my brother actually starts talking to him. I have to, I have to say. And he says that he worked at App Annie at the time, and he starts saying, but really I have this other project I want to do on-demand cannabis. And I said, that's an amazing idea. Like, do you have a team? He's, no, you know. So from there it was kind of like, well, here's all my ideas in the world that I just came up with on the spot for this yeah. amazing business idea. So we kind of went, rode Space Mountain, kind of talked through that. <laughs> and then uh, we met back in San Francisco and got going right away. So that was in November of 2013, and then we, got the business out July of 2014. That's wow, pretty that's awesome. Incredible. So you're there from the beginning. Yes. So born in space before now. we get too much <laughs> into, uh, yeah, before we get too much into the, to ease, sure. I want to just, um, I, I'm not being a marketing guy myself. If, if I look back at, at marketing, it seems to have, especially online marketing, right? It went from very kind of intuition based kind of old, like the magazine print marketing, uh, mindset kind of just taken online and then it started to the you know more and more more, um ad tech and and tools started to get developed and now i feel like um marketing is much more analytics based than it was even at the Mm -hmm. time when you started uh working with uber is that true and like how where do you think what does it mean to be marketing something online now really yeah i think um it's all about being very thoughtful um, in what you're doing and actually setting up that measurement framework right away. I think one thing we really did well at Ease was coming at it with that, okay, what tools do we know other on-demand platforms are using and how do we set a, set ourselves up for success right away? So, you know, things like a promo code system that properly functions, like promo codes for us is not mo- only about giving coupons, it's actually about attribution and understanding like what people respond to. So that's one example, but I think, yeah, measurement's r- obviously really important. And I think what's cool about the tools that have, um, and, the, and the progress they've made is, it's really democratizing analytics for people like marketers that can now go into something like a Chartio, and, or, or sorry, in a mode analytics, these different platforms you guys may be familiar with. We've sort of tried a lot of different ones and, and all of them give us some additional insight. Um, and then our team uses that on a daily basis to see you know, in, in a certain market, what what channels maybe are performing better than others. Because, you know, that's been interesting too. Just like on a geographic basis, you can see the differences in, in terms of marketing. But on a, from a digital lens, definitely you got to set yourself up right away with the right uh, tools. So has it, sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I think that's a really important insight that I want to hammer home to, you know, some sure. of the founders that are watching is if you're launching a platform or if you have a product, don't do discounts just for discount's sake. Don't do it just to onboard people. Mm-hmm. Like, actually use it as a tool to kind of follow like what's being most effective in your marketing. One hundred percent. Yep. So, is it is it fair to say that the the tools have developed to the point where I feel like there was a time when um, if you were doing online marketing, you needed a lot of tech expertise. Mm-hmm. And are the tools kind of there now where you don't necessarily need a bunch of tech expertise? You just it's back to understanding marketing and the tools kind of solve the the tech problems that you would need to get the data you need. I would say yes and no. Okay. You know, I think you there are definitely the tools are easier, like 100% from kind of four or five years ago. I think there a lot of companies are doing a, a good job making things more accessible to marketers. I, the basic examples I can give you are, um, you know, something like a Mailchimp that has a, a host of apps that integrate into it and mm-hmm. can power your site, things like Squarespace, right? Like today we can throw up a website in a day. Minutes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Well, a shitty one in 20 minutes. A nicer one a day. Nice yeah. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can do it in 20 minutes. No, You've just, uh, I've revealed my standards. Yes, <laughs> and my, my and, and me as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, my point is to say that they're there, but certainly like to get to that, what I would say that next level of, of operational, you know, capability, you need te- pe- people on your team that are very savvy uh, from a technology perspective, and they're working closely with marketing. I think we were we were fortunate in the early days and, and today to have strong tech people come in and, and kind of build that framework and support us. Yep. Like I, I give you an example earlier when we were talking before the show about um, the funnel that for like onboarding drivers that dispensaries use. So we helped implement this 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 process that allows them to, you know, 
basically track that funnel and see it through the stages and trigger communications through those stages. So um, that type of process, you know, has been, you know, incredibly important to our business in terms of scalability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say look at look at what you have going and it may work for you now, but kind of think, you know, two, three X your growth um, a year or your goal, you know, whatever your goals are and look at like, are those tools set up to get you there? And do you know enough about where you are to to kind of inform that path, which is the measurement piece. Sure. So, so let's. I want to get into measurement, but before I do, I want to. I'm, I want to have some kind of practical, kind of actionable data for for founders who maybe sure. don't know much about this. What tools do you like or use or recommend, and for what kind of things? What are the What are the top marketing related tools that you like? You mentioned Mailchimp. Is that something you like? Or? Uh, well, we personally, I, I like that for smaller. I recommend that to smaller businesses just because it's easy to use. Um, we know we use Iterable, which okay. is a startup in San Francisco. They do, it's a nice, um, you know, kind of a marketing automation, customer communications platform. Works well for us. Um, you know, we, we from an analyst perspective, we use Mode. Uh, Mode's really a really great tool. Um, on, the, on the sort of driver's process side, we use tools like, uh, like, like Fountain, which is the one I mentioned. Yep. That's their new brand. And yeah, I think, keep in mind, we can't do a ton of paid marketing. Right. So I, I don't have like the solution for that uh, as it relates to ease. Most of our people watching can't do paid marketing either. So That's right. <laughs> so you guys get it. Um, so I would say, you know, on that point, uh, I would just reinforce that email is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Look at your customer life cycle. Email is still important. It's, I just want to, it's almost 2018. <laughs> I know. It's like, and I just, because a lot of people, I mean, I'm shocked that I keep hearing that. I know, yeah. And I assume other people are shocked. Maybe this is just me projecting. No, I am too. Email is still a thing and it's important. Can you just like dive in, like why, how? I, I mean, it's just, you know, people, it's their primary work channel that they use. So they open, you know, they're there, uh, you know, but SMS, you know, for us, text message mar marketing is, is very important as well. Okay. But that's gotta be tasteful. That's gotta be valuable. Um, that's something you have to really be mindful of going into that. So people um, are more forgiving of a marketing email and less forgiving of an obvious marketing text. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That makes sense. And they're used to getting deals through email as well. So there's like part of that just mm -hmm. we're socialized to to do that. Yeah. But yeah, I think email is still relevant, definitely, and and people lean on it, especially if they're going into a new service or or platform or even a product. Like, mm -hmm. don't neglect uh, customer relationships when you are a product manufacturer. Look for ways to build that relate that um, database and work with the distributors to um, find ways to engage those people, right? Whether it's through some sort of rebate program, whether it's through, um, I don't know, uh, just giveaways or, or I would say just or maybe even events, right? There's, there's ways to partner with those distributors to get in front of those, uh, those customers. And that's something that Ease is looking to do more and more of mm -hmm. as like a marketplace as partner with part of manufacturers, understand their goals, and then work together to get out in front of people and build that relationship. So, okay, that's super helpful, thank you. Yep. So now, so now you've, 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 let's get back to ease. You've, you've come to ease. Um, I, you know, I know there's, there's lots of different metrics that people throw out that are important. There's vanity metrics people use for things, and there's, um, and metrics actually can change over time depending on what's important to your business. What's the kind of first data that you feel like is critical to collect when you've got nothing and you're starting out and like, okay, what do I really need to make sure that I've got to start with before I can really build anything from there? Yeah. There's, well, it's going to be a little bit different depending on your business. Yeah. Um, for me, what I would always say to look at is kind of customers. Are you getting more of them? Right? Mm -hmm. what, is your, what is your kind of goals and acquisition? Right. And how are you doing there, right? And looking at which of those are working and then doing more of that. So that basic like kind of top of the funnel. Top of funnel. Okay. Like are we are we filling this opportunities? Are we creating opportunities and leads or okay. on the B2B side or on customers on a B2C side? Then it's retention. Are we keeping them around? Right? Because this again, it's all it's all the basics of a business being successful is like, do you have something that people want? Right. And do, once they try it, do they want it again? So this is interesting. I would have intuitively thought it would be the reverse, that you would start with kind of uh, conversion and retention and then worry about the top of the funnel. Are you suggesting that people should start optimizing for top of the funnel first? Or that is what I don't know. I mean, I'm not yeah, a marketing guy, no. so I could be an idiot. <laughs> well, Ben would agree with yeah, that. Yeah, actually. Well, you need to start with a good product. 
right? So your, your user research, the, uh, the, the belief system that you come into the marketplace with should be like, what I have to provide is good and people are gonna like it. How do you know that? I mean, I would say <laughs> local community, right? Tap your, your friends and, and family and have them try it and give you feedback, open honest feedback. Go out in the street and ask people you never met before as well. Like a lot of it is kind of that scrappy sentiment. I, I really believe, yeah. and, and we did that certainly a lot in the early I was gonna days. Ask, how much did you talk about pot delivery to random people on the streets of San Francisco? And you, I think you'd be surprised about how many people I've single-handedly signed up and told about these. It's in yeah. the thousands. Nice, for sure. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So you, it was really grunt work early on. Oh, completely. You know, we, I, I, I tried to explain this phenomena to some people the other day because our new, our growth team. We have this very, like, powerhouse growth team now. Right, these people from Zynga and Disney that you know, really amazing people. And I'm like this, you know. Just, you know, really like you the scrappy guy. Scrappy was, guy, yeah. At Dolores <laughs> Park, yeah, four years ago, trying to convince people they were yeah, asking, yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I know some of this stuff, but for me, it was when people they pulled me in the room. They're like, Jamie, how did you guys launch San Diego? Mm -hmm. What is this? What is this growth like? Whoa! And I said, let me try to explain it to you in in a way that's like that. In, you know, maybe you could take it and run with it later. But I called it community marketing, mm -hmm. and I called it how you tap into. Um, a those nodes and it's not influencer marketing not in like the paid social media way but how do you find people who are just passionate about something that believe in something that believe in what you're doing and then incentivize them mm -hmm. and engage them and, and be very open and honest with them like hey we we need your help we want to grow this thing we want you to be a part of it give them that sense of ownership because i think that's really what we did well when we were coming out like three years ago yeah. trying to launch this new service and people People really responded well because it wasn't a company telling them, it was their friends. Yeah. So you're finding evangelists in a very organic yeah. way and then you're kind of empowering the evangelists in, to be part of your movement, basically. Let's, yes. let's, I mean, let's unpack that a little bit because it's yeah. easy to say. It's easy like, we need to find our evangelists, right? Like um, those, those early adopters. But how do you actually incentivize them to evangelize your product? Besides just delighting them and making them happy with your product, are there certain methods that you you've used to kind of get them to help expand the business really quickly? Yeah, I would say, you know, you need some sort of monetary incentive, mm. right? So for us, it could be in the form of credits towards the platform. Oh, refer or, a friend, get a $20 so credit. So referral like is one big mm -hmm. uh, tactic of, of that or strategy, you know, within that umbrella. The other one would be paid contractors, right? Y they could be on an hourly basis, but you don't say to them, you're an hourly worker. Mm -hmm. You're an evangelist, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. A lot of it is the positioning of what you're doing and giving people that sense of ownership that, like, hey, this is your community to run. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think there's, I think people, you know, people in the end, like, they need some incentive that can, you know, keep them motivated. But the other one is is that sort of intangible, the change the world thing I was joking about earlier, yeah, right. right? Like, you have an, this is a historic milestone in history that we are all a part of, which is amazing. How do we, you know, take that ownership and, and run forward, like almost shoulder the burden of the industry and like pioneer and push things forward? And I think that's one thing we try to always talk about and instills that sense of pride and ownership and, and changing a society in a positive way. So a lot of this has, relates to brand quite obviously, right? And, yes. and kind of the, the, the brand that you're building, the persona, how you want people to perceive ease or whatever company you're doing this with. Um, and, it sounds like the evangelists really need to be people who who are kind of bought into that whole thing, and, you, and you're and you're going. It's not just a thing that you wrote down that like this is the brand that we want to do, but you're you're really implementing it with these people and saying, okay, well, you're not just hourly workers, you're whatever it is, you're part of this thing. Um, how you know? Can you talk a little bit about building a brand from scratch because? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, you know, you mentioned people from Disney and other people coming in to help you with marketing. And, you know, something that I've experienced in the past is you got the skill set to do marketing for PepsiCo. It's very different from the skill set for what you did, which is like, never heard of ease. It's a misspelled word and no one, ever, no one knows what the hell you're doing. <laughs> and you did it from scratch, right? And like yeah. building that brand from scratch is a very different skill set. Can you? Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I I always find myself explaining what what we do at a startup or at ease in the early days is like balancing brand and growth. So you kind of always approach what you're doing with you you got to do both and you can't do one at the expense of the other. And that's a really hard thing. And I think that's what I tried to explain in the early days is like, you know, we want to have 
you know, Uber's operational capacity with Lyft's brand. It sounds funny, but like this is like <laughs> sure. one thing I said in the early mm -hmm. days to like yeah. kind of define our rails because yeah. part of building a brand is actually defining those guardrails. Like, right. What are we? What do we represent? What? Why are we here? And so you'll actually, if if making a decision to grow compromises the brand in some way, you'll hold off on that until you're kind of ready. From Definitely. A brand perspective. Yeah, and and sometimes we've kind of taken a hit on brand to do growth and vice versa. Sure, no but one's perfect. It's but, not perfect, yeah. yeah, but that's generally the, the sentiment. And with Ease, really our, our focus was convenience. Like, really what our brand is about is making people's lives easier, mm -hmm. better, and yep. we do that with by giving them high quality products with the utmost convenience. Like, so that's, that's really our story. So when we look and at the marketplace, uh, sort of at a higher level, what we wanted to do, recognizing like, oh wait, this is working, you know, because when we came to market, it was, how did we build it from scratch? Right. Well, I looked, I went and, you know, we had this great name, Ease, yeah. it works, it's, it's, a, it's delivery. A good name. And, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we were, and that's kind of what I walked into, sort of Keith already had that. Yeah. And he actually asked, he gave me an option, Delive or Ease? And I was like, Ease. ease. Yeah. And we, so we start Easy. to go, and he's like, okay, what do you think on colors and all that? So I, we looked at the marketplace and it's all black and green back then. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, it sounds mm -hmm. funny, but yeah. it really was. Like we went to a conference and it was like, everything was black and yeah. green. Yeah. Which I get. And everything I, had pot leaves in it as and well. Everything, yeah, everything had pot leaves. So what we did is we looked at, okay, well, wh what's the what's the story here? How do we sh shed light on the fact that cannabis has all these amazing health, health and wellness benefits? And so we, we thought, okay, let's go blue. Let's go into this blue, but let's make it fun. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where you see the exception of the color is like we want it to be inviting like a tech platform, but also um, have some of that subconscious cues of health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we started. And we actually positioned ourselves on-demand healthcare delivery in the early days. Oh, really? Can, can we dig it into the naming just a little bit? Um, because <laughs> a lot of companies, when they're naming, when they're naming themselves, they'll, they'll go out, go on GoDaddy or something, or name.com or whatever, um, and just start typing in things and see what's available. And when you first look at Ease, it's like, oh, it's a funny spelling, but it wasn't because ease.com ease was available. Like you didn't have that to start with. It used to be like ease up or yeah, something. Yeah, that's right, right. yeah. Um, and so it's like, how did, how did you decide to go with ease, like with the Z? I mean, maybe it was the Lyft influence. Um, and then like, how did you work into that ease.com? Like it's uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was a, that's a process. So, <laughs> and probably money, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, we, yeah, we definitely had to buy that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say, the, the the spirit of the company was convenience even in its inception. Mm -hmm. So we looked at words that, you know, represent that. Like, it's from a branding perspective, that's what it's all about is like understanding the role that your brand is gonna play in someone's life and trying to, to capture that spirit in a brand. Mm -hmm. And the name is obvi the obvious place to start, but if sometimes you can't get the name, that's okay. Like, you can still build a brand out around some, uh, another one. But for us, Ease was, um, the strongest one that conveyed that sense. And then we believed that, yeah, the little playful Z was a little bit, a kind of a tech, a tech, a nod, to, a nod yeah, to technology. Yeah. Yep. And like, like Lyft certainly is a good example of, sure. of that. But yeah, later it was, we were going with easeup.com and it worked. People actually understood it. Like, like ease up, man. Yeah, like, no, it was funny. Yeah, they used to call sense. us ease up. We're like, no, it's ease. They're like, oh, ease up. And we're like, okay, <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So you know, we we were okay with it, but we wanted to be as short as possible because we think you know that's important is sure. to reinforce in our brand that less is more. Like short, mm -hmm. even in the URL, it's simpli simplicity. So that's kind of why we ended up purchasing that domain. But it took us like a couple years because it was like mm -hmm. that price tag. We we're like, oh well. Oof. Because it's not necessary. What I would say is like, we, we even had a collective uh, opinion that this is not a necessary thing for our brand. Right. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's a, that's a wise way to start because like Ben said, we do see a lot of founders like, oh, I can't be this because the domain is not available. I'm like, eh, it's not, yeah. unless it's owned by Microsoft or something, it's probably, <laughs> eventually you could buy it. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, you've, you've said this a couple times now. You said the, your, our brand's all about convenience, right? And you're using the same word over and over, convenience, and it's a single word. Um, and what strikes me about that is I think a lot of companies, um, when they think about their brand, they have a very complex like mission statement and well, we're about this and that and this and that and the other thing and mm -hmm. this, is, this is who we want to be and it's this very uh, complex tapestry, right? And that's actually hard to transmit to people. Uh, was it a conscious choice that, to say like, okay, we need one thing that we're about and that's our one thing? and what should it be, and it's gonna be convenience, and then just like push that out as simplistically as possible everywhere. Yeah, 
I can, so I'll take, it's evolved slightly, but yes, it's all been, always been about convenience. But in the way we articulated that externally in the early days was easy, quick, and professional. Mm. Easy, mm. it's in the name. Technology that's seamless is easy. Yeah. Quick, and that people want it on demand. It's the age of instant gratification. We recognize that. Mm -hmm. Our operational model lends itself to be faster than other delivery services. We wanted to reinforce that. Professional, because the industry, in our opinion at the time, needed to be right. elevated no, that in that way. that definitely set you apart. So that we yeah. took that, and that was sort of our keywords that drove us in the early days, and we're evolving that and rethinking it, because right now our goal is to move east from a technology company to a lifestyle brand. Okay. So like strategically recognizing where the market is going. We really want to push ourselves that direction. That's what um, why we you see this photography. Mm -hmm. So um, our goal was, is to not focus on the products, but focus on the moments. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like what you're seeing here. But yeah, I would say look at those those brand values, which is what I call those keywords, mm -hmm. and and pick like two or three. And to your point, don't get ten. Don't right. don't say you're about. 10 things, I think that's, you, you're right on. If you can pick those couple things that really define you and make you different, it's all about differentiation. Right. Right? Right. So I think, yeah. It also makes it a lot easier when you're out there talking and telling your story, you know, talking to the press and all that. It's really easy for them to then relay your, your message to everyone. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Control the message by having a simple, like, co you know, cohesive, consistent message. Great. Cool. So. Let's talk about a couple, um, you know, you've got experience more than just at ease here. And you've seen people, I'm sure, make a lot of mistakes uh, early on in marketing. Um, made it myself, yeah. Maybe made one or two yourself, <laughs> sure. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes that you see uh, founders make when they're kind of starting out from a marketing perspective? I think um, trying to do too much is like the obvious one that oh, I would say. What do you mean by that? Like too many, too many, too many channels, too many, too many channels, too many ideas, just too much, right? Okay. Like you, you have to make some judgments about like, this is the thing we're going to do and we're going to really try this out and give it a full chance and, and see how it goes. I think, you know, if you're trying to push everything forward, you're not going to push any of them to the finish line. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, I would say doing too much is like the obvious one. So I, that, but I would say there's other ones like for me, uh, you know, if you do pick an idea and you leave one behind, like don't abandon that idea. Cause a lot of the things that we've seen in the early days that are, are like something that we really were excited about that we ended up saying, ah, it's just not the right time or whatever. It's, that's really what it is. It's about timing. Mm. So don't abandon an idea that doesn't make sense at that time. Cause you, you may, in six months have the perfect opportunity to bring that back in. Or when you build out a team because you raised capital, you can put a team around that. Or a product line that you wanna do, but you're focused on X, X category and Y is like so, somewhat off brand right now, maybe you can find a way to make that part of your story and bring that in later. Which, so I would say timing, timing is everything when it comes to ideas. It may be the best idea in the world, but it's just- Wrong time. Wrong time. Yep, yep. That, that's good advice. Um, so what are some of the, you know, those are some of the com common mistakes. When do, when do you, so I, I coined a term a while ago called predatory service providers. <laughs> and I had particular, and th these are the, and I have particular. I understand that right away. Right, great. Especially uh, in this industry. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I had some, some particular types of them in mind uh, without naming names. Um, but they, they're, they're these outsiders who come in to startups to quote help, right? And we only charge, you know, your entire budget basically for start, right? And one of the categories of those are like marketing and PR outside help. When do you, when do you say mm -hmm. like, oh, it's worth having someone help me with branding or help me with uh, PR or help me with marketing strategy? Like when, if ever, and I'm sure it is eventually appropriate, but like when is that appropriate and how do you make that determination of when you should kind of spend those dollars? Yeah, I think there's, the short answer is in, you know, in my opinion, I think like as a marketing and PR person right away, um, I think that the, the actual cues though really, um, so if you have a good product and you already know that, that what you have works, that's a really good time, right? Yeah. If you, it's almost like if you're looking at the progress 
kind of like when I talked about the brand and growth balance, if you're looking at like the product and the brand balance, yeah. if the product's getting there and the brand's falling behind, that's the time. Yep. So there's an obvious mm. path there. But also I would say when you feel like you're trying and just f spinning your wheels and getting frustrated again and again about something, that's a good signal. Yep. Um, but then again, some people, they, they know right away that it's a weakness of theirs. And if you do know that, I think that's a really great place to start. I think in this c category, there's no time to waste. Yeah. Certainly, like, mm. if you have a good idea right now is the time to go get yeah. that help and talk to people and build a team and, like, you know, Would branch you have out. outside people come in or hire them internally? or Because a lot of times hiring internally is not really an option, um, but outside can be quite expensive sometimes, right, if you're, like... Yeah, but, but cheaper than hiring. I think, maybe. Sometimes. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's. I think it's. It's in my experience, it's been comparable, right? The okay. the cost in, in terms of which it, would you do then? You know, I usually. I, I think for a small company, a contract to hire type thing is great. Mm -hmm. if okay, you can so find that contract, but kind of with a long term vision of maybe bringing them on board eventually. Yeah, and but see, to me, like early can mean so much. So I would say like sure. when you're really, really early, yeah, I would contract people. Right. Um, right. At maybe at the more senior level mm -hmm. to help you with the vision, and then consider hiring people on the operational level okay. that can really, you know, take that ownership and push stuff forward. So just then, I just want to clarify because I'm yeah. make, make it clear. So um, you might have, for example, a marketing person internally who's doing the day-to-day -day tweets or Facebooks or whatever, but you've hired someone to kind of help set the strategy and tell you what the metrics are and how you should be doing that. That would be my suggestion, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. But, but not hiring the outsider to like, manage all of my communications with my customers generally. I 100% agree with th not doing that, yes. Okay. <laughs> you had a terrified look in your face. Yeah, yeah I was like, like whoa, I, I, liked, whoa. I liked what you said before, not the last thing. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> that that's good. Um, all right, cool. Let, I, hold on, I have some notes and I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss sure. some stuff. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I, we talked about metrics already, but I did wanna talk about, um, you know, how do you know, uh, you know, how do you know when you're kind of wasting your time on something um, from a from a marketing perspective? Like, how do you know that like okay, this just isn't this is a waste of time? You know, it's because some it's things are measurable clear. very easily. Yeah, it's right? not That's the problem. It's not always clear. I would say, I would say trust the customer response. Right, like if you're not getting the response you want right away, usually that's a good signal. Um, bounce it off your team, right, internally, or your, if, and if people are hesitant to kind of get behind it, like, that's usually pr signals that are there. Okay. There may be less quantitative that I, you know, we typically look for. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough to see. So, so let me add, so like, okay, digital marketing general, digital marketing, you can kind of measure. Oh, we did X, Y, Z, they, this many people clicked on the link. Mm -hmm. We kind of know whether it worked or not. We can measure conversion. Mm -hmm. But you guys also have, and not just you, right? You have billboards mm -hmm. and print ads. How do you measure the efficacy of those at all? And when do you decide, like, oh, yeah, we're going to spend 20K on a clear channel That's a good ad. example. Good question. So we, what we did, um, and the reason why you see a lot of campaigns uh, for, from, for out of home, which is billboards, buses, and the like, mm -hmm. is we basically looked at, the customers that are coming in through promo codes, which are all through other channels. And then we looked at that separate group and then the growth in that separate group, and yeah. then do surveys like to the them. negative space. Oh, interesting. Take the negative space and survey yeah. them and ask them where they heard about you. It's as simple as that. Oh, and, interesting. And, and we were blown away with results. You know, it turns out this thing really works. Uh, okay, so, so you found a way to measure it, basically. Yeah, we found a way to measure it. Again, scrappy mindset. Yeah. Remember, like, we're all scrappier as a result of the restrictions in our category sure. than we would be in another one. So, like keep that mindset and like embrace it. But for us, yeah, it was, you know, those types of channels really work. But I wanted to say one more thought on on that. How do you know when you're not, when oh. you shouldn't be mm -hmm. um, pushing it forward? I would say when what you're driving, even from those campaigns that you're running, don't roll up to the overall company goal for that time period. Oh, interesting. So okay. like it, it's you really stay anchored to, hmm. you Focus know, what, what, what the company's <laughs> trying to do, like yeah. what your CEO is trying to do, what your manager is trying to do, what what you as a group, what we're all trying to do and achieve, if it's a growth in sales, maybe those tweets don't matter for now. Right. Like as much as we want to support that channel, maybe it's not driving that. And we should double down on our customer communications, right. knowing that that's going to be more directly that tri driving revenue. And maybe there's a moment when you say, yeah, social will become a strategy for us and be more important for us. But until Facebook right. like allows us in there, 
Yeah. Right Maybe now it's, it's email or whatever it is. Yeah, right? so yeah. for us, like social hasn't been as um, strategic, but we still value it. It's just like our resources ha are so focused elsewhere that, for example, like ease, like our social media will get a big boost maybe next year but for now we're kind of you know not super excited about where we are yeah. and right. that's okay so that's kind of a good example interesting I, I i think the the underlying kind of theme with all of this is no matter what part of the business you're focusing on or or like what type of business you are it all comes down to like measuring the effectiveness of your efforts right um i was listening to Another podcast. There are other podcasts out there. I know. I'm sorry. Um, I was listening to another podcast this morning, and, and they were just talking about it's like every company that is worth you know worth its weight is a data company. Like they're they're focusing on 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 the data that they're they're collecting and kind of making a better business every day out of it. Yeah, I I agree. Data is critical. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry. Did you have more? Line well, no. I was just going to say I I would be interested in kind of like transitioning this to kind of focus a little bit more on, on ease itself and kind of like what, what you're seeing through through the efforts at ease. Yeah, I mean, I was going to actually similarly just kind of talk about CPG, right? Because you guys have insight into this, which is data, right? Mm -hmm. Into like, mm -hmm. what the hell's going on with the California market? Where is it going? And if anyone has a crystal ball, you guys are probably in the <laughs> in the category of potential crystal balls, right? Because you've got a lot of data. That, that, just, that, didn't, that didn't sound well, right. Give me a second and um, let me... Yeah. No, it's... Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> I would, it didn't. I, uh, yeah, I think it's... You know, the general, we, so we do have a program that we created to actually open up some of that data. Hmm. So um, you, certainly we believe we have the m largest, like, data set in terms of customer transaction and preference and behavior, all that different thing, uh, all the different things. But when you look at, um, I encourage you all to look at Ease Insights program. We have uh, a few reports we launch. We do the state of the cannabis market. We do a modern cannabis consumer report, hmm. and we do those annually. Um, and sometimes we'll do like more holiday related data that we release. And um, yeah, when you look at those, I can give you some of the macro trends. Yeah. Is, you know, definitely women are the fast, you know, fastest growing segment in terms of, you know, we saw 30%, 30, 33% growth uh, year over year in women coming onto Ease platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really amazing to see. We see like baby boomers are fast growing, the, the fastest growing sort of um, age segment. Which is which was interesting. Millennials, as a percentage of overall, is decreasing. Wow, it, they're still growing, right? But, right, but if you look at as a percentage, not as fast as everyone else. Not as fast as baby boomers. Huh. Mm -hmm. So, so what we're seeing basically is that the mass market consumer is the new cannabis consumer. Yeah, right. It's not this the the stoner of right. the past. We all know this intuitively, but our data sees is reinforcing that. Um, and then we see the new trends, the innovative product lines, or or people are starting to adopt. And and try them, you know, things like topicals are on the rise, which was really interesting to see. Like the repeat order percentages on topicals is very high, so, okay. so people are finding products working. they like. They're working, then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. which is awesome. I think that uh, the wellness category uh, of within cannabis is increasing, right? If you have, you know, we kind of bucket it down to people use cannabis for relief or enjoyment, and then wellness is kind of that category mm -hmm. in between. Mm -hmm. The kind of you know. Uh, and people are definitely looking at those new, like higher CBD products, lower THC, that kind of give them the benefits from a medical perspective or therapeutic perspective, but aren't giving them the psychoactive. And those products are on the rise as well. So there's sort of everything is growing and as people kind of come into the market, but I would say those are kind of the key things that we see. And then uh, the other thing I'll say just from a brand point of view yep. is that people do buy based on branding to some degree and increasingly so. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for products that mirror things that they'd see at Whole Foods or in broader CPG. Like, right. they're not necessarily looking for these, um, for brands that are selling them on the in the inputs. That's sort of a, a heritage um, When you thing. say the inputs, like X strain grown from where? Or? Yeah, like okay. features, yeah. like I would okay. call that like a feature would be like the genetic makeup, mm. the um, location where it's grown. I think those things still are, meaningful for the majority, but in terms of like the trend, mm. people are starting to look more for things like um, the effect-based right. positioning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyone entering the market that hasn't been regularly consuming for a long time is thinking things like, how is this product gonna affect me? I think that's the number one question in, the, right. in California right mm. now, is how will this product affect me? So if you look at your packaging and the, you're answering that question, you're well positioned to get the new wave of consumers that are coming in, you know. 
in two weeks. That's what you look for when you look to carry products. It's one of the things we look for is like okay. how, how, you know, can somebody who's just getting into the market quickly look at and understand about what you're doing and will it, will they uh, find, will they be able to identify how it will fit into their life? And that's going to be a key, a key it's, it's really interesting that you could kind of really dig into the numbers and, and maybe you guys have done this already where it's like after people have entered the industry and they've, they've tried these kind of effect based products, um, like what percentage of them are going on to be the connoisseurs that are kind of like then starting to look more at mm. what farms it's coming from and what is the strain and that kind of stuff. Right. No, and this is exactly right. There's an evolution, huh. right? There is certainly is from, we kind of are mapping this customer journey from all the way from the skeptic mm -hmm. through evangelist, right? So if you can drive people, if they come in at newbie, let's call it, yeah, right. and you move them to regular, then maybe at the regular stage, they start to look at things like the genetics mm -hmm. that then move them into what we call the evangelist. Right. So I think like there's definitely that journey, and I think they do ladder up mm -hmm. to the canisseur level. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that's, there's definitely, that's gonna happen, and our goal is to, provide a platform where all those different people can thrive, yeah. right? And get what they want. And, but we, we really see the opportunity for us as a convenience position brand to be primarily focused on those new people mm -hmm. and welcoming them in with open arms. Well, and, and then the, the CPG companies can then take it upon themselves to like do that initial offering and then kind of create different product lines that, that ha help people evolve through their own products. 100%. Yeah, if yeah. Ease is the marketplace for everyone, then the brands are targeting specific audiences. That's right. right. Very cool. So, you know, there's a lot of talk, obviously, where it's uh, mid-December, right? It's 2018's around the corner. Um, there's a lot that happens in the industry in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who are, like, it's always, sometimes we can get wrapped around the axle about all the shit going on in the industry, and we assume that everyone outside kind of knows, mm -hmm. but they don't. <laughs> um, so for the average Californian, what happens in 2018? What does it look like? What's different? Really? If, yeah, I mean, I say to people when they ask me, if you're over 21, you can get cannabis from... How quickly do you, you think that will it. actually be happening? We, uh, and, and at what scale? Like, are you guys going like right away? Or what's... So we, we plan to get out right away as fast yeah. as we can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are working with and your brands are already regulators to understand those timelines. They're still kind of shifting, to be honest. Yep. We suspect the first week of Jan will there'll be several of our markets will be opened up. We're looking at new markets like LA very closely, but it's all about timing. With you know, mm -hmm. our we've always worked very closely with regulators. It's part of our strategy is not to like burn those relationships. Right. So we you know work with them, wait for them to That's give us the, the green light and the Uber yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, it's, it, it makes sense, right, yeah. to just take the time. Um, but, you know, we, we do suspect that several of the markets will open up in the first week of January. So a lot of people will be able to, you know, okay. go, it's just over so you don't 21. anticipate like a shortage or like downtime or anything or kind of, because there's, there's a lot of hand wringing in the industry, but it's hard to tell how much of it is real and how much will actually we, manifest. We're, op we're optimistic. We've, we've always been optimistic, I think. We are prepared to be agile, you know, if we if we are in, unable to operate for, call it a few days or something, so be it. Right. Our business, we have enough um, to, to, to do <laughs> right. that, like, the team will stay busy and we'll kind of work with regulators to try to, to make the positive change that we need. But we're very optimistic, I think, about, um, you know, coming in the market. Sure. If, if someone was going to start a CPG product tomorrow and they had a million ideas, uh, where would you try and focus them? Ooh, that's a good one. Right, any product that could be carried on ease. I won't say CPG. I'm using that very broadly. Anything you might carry. In the, would, in the ca cannabis category? Yeah, what would you, where would you focus them? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, we, we have a, the categories that are doing really well are like vaporization. It's like a very fast growth category as well. So I would say I'd look at wellness categories and look at, and then look at competition. Mm. And if you feel like you can compete well, like that'd be a good place to go. Um, then the other side of it would be vaporization. Um, edibles still remain kind of a smaller category. Mm -hmm. they, there's certainly ones that do very well, um, but it's a little bit more risky in terms of like, because people still kind of, you know, a little nervous about, the little nervous mm -hmm. about it. But I think if you can find a, uh, 
if you can find that balance between low and high dose edible and you can reinforce consistency that this is like you know accurately dosed and consistent i think and if you can have an innovation in that category you could do well okay um you know gummies do well but you can't target them at kids right, things right. like that yeah. um yeah i think it's it's kind of like you can go anywhere in it as long as you are providing something that's a little bit more innovative. I think innovative form factors is really going to be mm. in this next year where people stand out because like everyone's going to try to create mm -hmm. based on like in the paper category, like based on a cartridge that's available everywhere. But if you can come in with a new device that is more uh, has something about it that's special or different. I know that like Arc has like a flower. Um, a portable fire flower vaporizer like that's something that people it's a pipe it's not even a vaporizer oh sorry a, a portable pipe that I'm looks so like a vaporizer <laughs> yes. Yes. thanks I, like that's cool <laughs> because it's like you're taking the spirit of the more traditional consumer and bring it into the new age that, that's actually really interesting yeah so yeah i i, I want to say something specific but i think you can no, really no, come okay. in I, with so many different what I, products what i would like to add to that is like innovate for a purpose, like solve a problem and differentiate through that. Don't just innovate there for innovation's go. sake. You know, it's like you might, you know, you might get an uptick in, in customers just because there's a cool factor to it initially, but that's not what's going to last. And so is it actually a better vehicle? Is the dosing easier? Is the, the, the predictable experience easier? Like figure out something and solve a, solve a problem. And, and that doesn't just have to do with technology. It could be a CPG, right? What he said, that's, that, <laughs> no, that's really, that's right on. That's exactly what. So what are you seeing these, you know, you talked about the newbies and kind of the, uh, the baby boomers coming in. What are they not liking? What's turning them off? What are they not like? Is there stuff that you're like, oh, you know, this is normal, but outsiders don't like it. Yeah, concentrates. Concentrates. Mm. Raw concentrates to them are like, whoa, what is that? Okay. Like, this is a weird, it's scary like I'm thing. Doing heroin or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Crack, right? yeah. The, okay. initial, the gut reaction is like, that's kind of scary. Yeah. It is scary. And it, and it is, right? It, it even is called a concentrate, right. which is like, whoa. Like, it sounds pretty. Like yeah. 151, it's right? Chemical. Like, yeah. yeah. So I think people are looking for, um, low, for in those newer segments, looking for lower dose products. Right. Um, that are premium packaged that maybe are even shareable kind of more bite-sized kind of mm -hmm. things um, so uh, yeah that's I would say that's kind of okay. innovative categories those that those groups are looking for cool well we should uh, we should go to some questions okay um, I think Michael because the time is a little bit screwed up right now what uh, how much time are we right now I want to I want to be yeah, cognizant okay cool okay. So we've got hands being raised, but only one person has the mic. So uh, hey, let's go to him. Good. My name is Chris. I'm with uh, Lumen Juices and the Living Soil Symposium. Uh, you, you're talking about the evolution of customers and this new onboarding of a totally new class and the evolution of their taste and what they're paying attention to. Um, do you see any shift towards people paying attention to organically produced products at all? Is there a focus on that that's growing? Cause I, I know in the past, the dispensaries I've interacted with, the managers there, said no one really cares yet. That was over the last year and a half. And I don't know, my hunch is telling me it's got to matter at some point. So are you seeing that yet? I would say I, I would marry the organic trend and focus with like the, the trend in wellness. I think, that, I think we will see that. You know, We don't see it specifically because I believe there's a restriction in terms of even saying the word organic right now in the category. Mm. Um, so that's going to kind of hold that back a little, but I, if you can find ways to articulate what organic means to people, I think that you're going to see a lot of the people, certainly like um, the new segments that we just talked about, are going to be looking for those products that tell them like this is clean, sustainably, sustainable, um, you know, pesticide free, all the things that they're looking for. And I think that's part of on our, our job as marketers in the industry is to help tell that story. So I think, yeah, that's going to be, I think it will come. I don't. Th I think it requires education, so it might take a little bit. So maybe towards the later part of next year, just like you know, crystal balling it. But I think, yeah, I think that's going to be important. So. Cool, David. David uh, Dave Rothenberg, off uh, camera, hey. co-founder of Mighty Health. We do we make uh, daily supplements with low doses of cannabis. Ooh. Um, I used to see a lot of text messages from Ease, 
and that seems to have largely gone away. I'm getting more emails. <laughs> have you changed the way? <laughs> how have you changed? What's changed, and, and how how do you use SMS differently now, if at all? So, I like your products. That's interesting, by the way. The you can show direction. Um, tech, yeah, I would say yeah. We definitely communicate a lot. Um, that's part of our strategy is to be high engagement. We monitor responses and and be sensitive to those things. In your case, maybe you weren't interacting with us or you gave us an indicator that you didn't like the messages um, and that may be why because we still do them I would say slightly less frequent a lot of it a lot of the times those are tied to goals or uh, either on like your specific customer we're trying to move you to that kind of regular stage perhaps um, but yeah I would say nothing really specifically has changed we are tr trying to be more cognizant of that that's one of those things that I think is like a little bit of a knock on the brand, at ex, you know, for growth. So over time, our goal is not to be the, you know, super frequent deals all the time, but it kind of works. So it's there's a little bit of a trade off, but I would say over time, our goal is, is to not communicate as frequently. So your experience now with like, uh, so this is close. There was a Does bunch of like super pro marketing like nuances into that response yes. is like <laughs> really? the fact that you have like yeah. multiple tiers of types of customers and you have these different like tech strategies like there's so many people that are that's so far away from but like it's, it's really cool to hear <laughs> sorry if i'm like no it's good no no it's no, awesome. i mean it makes, in fact we can chat more of course yeah in fact actually maybe we should just pause for a moment and have you like give an overview of like it seems like you do have different categories of customers you track what category they're in and you communicate with them differently and you're responsive to how they react is that correct? Yes. <laughs> I would, you know, Next question. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> He's a, make a great politician. Offline signups. And I was wondering, what, what's your best source of offline signups or any, any tips or tricks that you have there? As somebody mentioned Dolores Park. I uh, would love to hear what you think about that. On just general offline signups, guerrilla marketing, yeah. what's working and all that. Yeah, you know, I, I like this concept of community marketing. I think like finding people and getting them out there and having them be like almost your um, intelligence team, like to them coming back to you and saying, hey, here's it. But um, it all depends on your business, but like finding those, you know, for us, what's worked has been um, social groups, like things like um, yoga instructors and, and, and partnering with them, um, uh, I would say, People who already do things like Lyft and Uber, who are out kind of mm -hmm. doing work and meeting lots of people on a daily basis. Um, uh, other offline strategies that work for us, definitely um, paid marketing through billboards and stuff like that, but more on the affordable side, yeah. Parks, um, restaurants near them, not like right out in front of them, but any like hustle and bustle areas. Because it's generally impressions, right? A lot of it you can boil down to a numbers game. Like if you have people out in the right places at the right times, like you're getting the word out there, and then trying to establish a um, like a way to communicate with those people again, like not just like hey here's the thing, but like maybe you give them a card, it has your email, it's like hey email me, I can send you this. I think there's gonna be important. The important part of that is really on the tactical level. Mm -hmm. It's not just like being there at the park and hey we have a booth at the park today and we're giving out T-shirts. It's like how are we collecting the customer information so that we can use it later. Because the remarketing is as important as that initial thing you're doing. Yeah, Richard. Does it make is that helpful? Yeah. Totally. yeah. Awesome. Uh, also, when when you're done, I think Princessa has a question as well. So. Oh. Hi, thanks for coming in today. Yeah. I'm Zach. Hey, Zach. Um, so, he's a great platform because you guys are kind of one of the only platforms out there that really close the loop with the customer, right? Um, and that's really effective, not only for you guys, but also for the brands that are on your platform that want to learn more about you know, customer shopping habits and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a very extensive data set because of closing loop. Um, what, what are your brands most interested in learning about the customer experience and shopping habits? Like, what's the most important data point for them? Ooh, that's a good question. So we do provide them with those reports. I would say repeat order percentage, just my immediate reaction. Um, you know, and which products within their suite people are buying most. Because a lot of their thinking is, how am I going to adapt or improve my product strategy in terms of like what I'm making? 
So they look, they, they come to us with like a few SKUs um, and say, hey, you know, they have some hypothesis on what's gonna work, but we can actually tell them like, people like this one twice as much, and by the way, within that segment, oh, and then who it is, right? Like what's that persona? Like we can tell you, we can tell them the age, gender, location, like we can even, hmm pull it down to like zip code, where they're ordering, we can look at like bars, restaurants, home, mostly home, of course, um, but then you can look at all the other places. But um, yeah, I would say there's kind of the three things. One would be, probably the first one, sorry, is who. Who are they? How old are they? You know, that kind of demographic info is the first thing they wanna know. Because I think that's just like, how do you get that? They don't have that today, and we can give them that. So I think that's probably the first. Then the second is, which of my products are they buying the most? and you know, why, and the why could be a survey later that we could do sometimes. Uh, and then the third is the percentages that's repeat ordered so mm -hmm. that they can know like, because that's the best indicator of are they enjoying it, at least that we have right now. And then, but yeah, is that helpful? Yeah, that's great. Mike, the mic's not on, by the way, guys, so. It's not on at all. Well, you just gotta turn it on. Uh, princess. <laughs> princess knows how to handle the mic. You mentioned a little earlier on um, Ease Insights and the modern cannabis consumer, and I'm wondering if that information is available to to us who are who are not actually employees of Ease. Is that yes. Cool. And yes. how do we so, find it? Yeah, so you can just go to our, um, you can search Ease Insights online and you should be able to find it that way. Or you can um, go to our blog, which it's there. Um, but we always release, when we do our major reports, we release them uh, via press, you know, partnerships and announce them because we want people to know. Like part of what our goal is to like not keep all this data like, yes, we have this data and, you know, it's about opening it up to, to everyone because we think that if people have more visibility to these things about like, you know, the new consumers, that it actually helps elevate the industry as a whole. So yes, absolutely our data is, is released in like more of a report fashion. If we like opened up everything, you know, maybe that would be a little bit extreme, but we definitely report on like macro trends and, and brands on our platform get access to a portal that they can see um, their sales and, and stuff like that. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, no, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew Ranieri. I'm co-founder of Mighty Health. I'm partner with Dave. Cool, cool. Um, question for you on new products and when you bring new products onto the platform, what efforts do you do from a marketing side to give visibility to new products? How do you wait giving, you know, if there's promos or other opportunities that you give to, to different products on the platform that aren't like actual ease products? Mm -hmm. Just give me some, I'd love to hear some insight into the activities that you do to help bring visibility to those products. Yeah, so what we do is uh, we have like a go-to-market plan that we make with the brands. Um, we have a brand development team specifically focused on um, helping those brands you know, maximize their, you know, ease platform for their business. So the way I c would kind of break it down is first thing we do is have an understanding of what their, what their strategy is, like who are they trying to reach? And then we kind of come up with a creative campaign. Um, usually what we do is bring brands on for a couple week period before we do any communications to understand the natural sales on the platform. Um, Cause we don't want to kind of Part of our balance is the supply demand balance, right? We wanna make sure that we are driving the right amount of demand, not too much demand. The worst case scenario, because again, we're all focused on the customer, customer is number one for us. So we don't wanna introduce them to a product then it run out the next day. Mm -hmm. So we want to understand the natural sell through, kind of watch that for some period of time. And then we do a promotion campaign. So typically what we do is we ask brands to have some discount that they kind of come in and partner on in terms of cost to get the product in more hands, right? So we, you can do, um, I think you, Ease is a unique channel and that like if you're a brand, you can access, you know, 100,000 people can see your, your message in a day, mm -hmm. right? We, when we do those campaigns, we can, you know, very, get a ton of reach for people. And then in terms of sales, like if you have a product like, like your guys' product, you could probably have like a few thousand people in, in that promotion period would actually have it in their hand um, so there's a lot of value, I think, to a brand in terms of getting reach in the industry, getting um, um, getting their product in people's hands. Uh, so, so that's sort of like what we do. And that's the promotion, right? Like, obviously, um, you know, we could just leave it on there and not do a promotion. That's up to the brand as well. We really encourage that because we think that's a good way to accelerate your um, sort of sales. But, uh, but yeah, I would say 
Uh, we do a promotion. We do custom photography. We have an in-house team. So we do lifestyle photography just like this. So Ronnie's often, in, um, he's one of our kind of like 10 models that we have do different things. Like, but we try to put it in some context, lifestyle context, mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of tell the brand story a little bit in terms of how they'd use it. And then um, after that, we can do a host of different things. So we're actually going to be coming out with a, more of an advertising packages kind of like you'd see from ad networks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from a brand perspective, you're actually getting more and more options um, as we go. So yeah, you can do anything from like uh, leave behinds in the bags, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ad placements on the site, promotions, discounts, all the whole nine yards. So it's becoming more flexible. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah, totally. Cool. Great. Cool. Um, kind of add on to Zach's question earlier about ease insights. Have you guys seen a brand take this data and actually make a new product development decision based on that data? Yes, a couple. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, but the short answer is yeah, we, we've seen brands come out with new things like a limited edition run of something. Um, uh, you know, uh, one, I'm trying to think of a good example for you. One brand actually created a new pre roll brand that was more appealing to um, a certain market, right? So there's like, Definitely people see, oh, we're skewing very, very male. We didn't know that. We thought our brand was for women. Like that's, so they'll mm -hmm. come up with a different line because they don't want to kind of sacrifice their spirit, right? So they kind of create a new line. So that's probably the best example mm -hmm. I can give you. Interesting. Cool. Other, any other questions before we wrap it up? No, Lou, oh. the, the, the non-vape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, And yeah. not a pipe either, right? No, it's a pipe. Uh, I just had a, I guess like a general question. Like when you, you kind of mentioned when you bring like new people and you kind of like are getting ready to push and you're like, yeah, we don't want supplies to run out tomorrow. What kinds of volumes for different products do you expect, you know, companies to have on hand? And, you know, how quickly, like just if you give like say a relevant product, like how much of it you might clear on a, on a regular basis? Uh, yeah, it varies, of course, across yeah. the categories, but definitely you should expect hundreds per day. Um, that's kind of like the guidance we would give people. You kind of think about ease like a collection of dispensaries, right, is the best way to think about it. So you're not, ha it's not the same conversation you would have with like one really big dispensary, it's like several really big dispensaries. Mm -hmm. So the, the volumes are higher, so you know, the team we have, the brand development team will work with you to help you understand those projections for your category. Like I'd just be throwing out all sorts of numbers right now if I gave you any, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you would come, the team would give you like comparables and say, we, you know, here's kind of a guess in terms of volume. And then, you, you know, can you supply this? A lot of times brands are like, not right now, we'll come back to you in two months. Mm -hmm. And like, then they come back around and they have supply and then dispensaries will, will work with them. Just to give a ballpark, it's like, you know, if you're talking hundreds a day, so you, your, your initial shipment is probably in the thousands, right? It's just, yeah, okay, so yeah, from ballparks, I would say, yeah, thousands, because you want to like, call it a two week to a four week supply. Mm -hmm. You'd We're talking three to 6,000 products probably. Right, right, which is a lot for some start brands starting out. Yeah, yep, yep, right. yep. Awesome. That makes sense. All right, I, anything else, I think that's, Probably it, but is there any other questions? All right. All right. Uh, Jamie Feaster, the VP of Marketing at Ease. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, guys. This yeah. was very informative. Um, yeah, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, yeah, you can you can just email me, jamie at ease.com, J-A-M-I-E at ease, um, or I guess LinkedIn is always a, is a good path, so feel free to reach out. Always available. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Great insights. Really appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, and if you're still watching, uh, that either means that you mistakenly jumped into the live feed and we just got lucky, or that you really like us and you like this information. So if you do, go to officehours.tv. Uh, and today, I'm going to ask you to click on the iTunes and go give give us a subscri or subscribe and give us a rating because that would really help us out. Uh, besides that, Hit us up next week. We have Debbie Goldsberry from Magnolia Wellness coming on. Uh, we were recently talking about, well, actually, we've been talking about it pretty much every episode for, for the last couple of weeks, uh, this transition into 2018. Uh, Magnolia has been around for years, and Debbie's had a lot of exciting things going on with the way she's been working through licensing, um, and she's really excited for 2018. So 
uh, come figure out how it's done uh, at that ground level. She literally wrote the book on starting a cannabis business, didn't she? Write, she did. Like, yeah. Cannabis business like for dummies or something. Idiot's she guide. Idiot's guide yeah. to cannabis or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she is published. Um, until then, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye. Thanks again, man. That's awesome, guys. Thank you.